April 15, 1968, the New York Mets traveled to Houston, Texas and played the Houston Astros in the fourth longest game in Major League Baseball history. The, ga the game went 24 innings. It took six hours to play. The final score of the game was one to nothing. Now imagine sitting at a baseball game for six hours watching 23 and a half innings and nobody scores a run. They kept playing the game until, of course, somebody won the game. Now I don't like games that are played where there's a tie. I mean, what does that mean? You know, I think there's losers and I think there's winners. And I can say that with full authority because I was at that game April 15th, 1968, and saw the entire game. A friend of my father's and a friend of our family, Thomas McBrayer, had two grandsons who lived in Oklahoma. They had come to Texas and invited me to go to the game to Houston. Uh, we were visiting them in Waco over, over the weekend, and they just said, hey, why don't you go with us? Man, little did I know that I would have to endure uh, that many hours. In fact, toward the end of the game on the scoreboard, it said, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's third game as much as you enjoyed the first two games that have been played. At the end of the innings that we've played in life, there is no tie at the end of the game. There are winners and losers. And it's true that as we live our lives, there are two categories of people that represent those who play this game of life. Those who are grateful and those who are ungrateful. As the Bible defines those who have a grateful heart. There are people who can say thank you to somebody else for something they've done. But we're going to see how the Bible explains what gratitude really is and what Thanksgiving is all about. If you have your Bibles, open them to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Just one verse, a few words that Paul writes that will lead to some questions that I want to answer this morning. He says, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to read it again. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, several questions I want to answer. First of all, what is giving thanks? Well, giving thanks is acknowledging with a heart of gratitude what someone has done for you or given to you, right? It's very easy to understand, but it, it's something that I have received. I didn't ask for it, but somebody has given that to me. A person who gives thanks recognizes three important things. Number one, the blessings you enjoy were given to you. You can't take credit for what you have received. Secondly, you're totally unworthy of them. A person who really understands biblical thanksgiving I'm not worthy of what I have received from God or from anyone else. Third, that your blessings are great and many. Sometimes our focus gets out of whack and we are focused on the, the things that we've not received, the, the, the problems of life. And today's message hopefully will cause us to stop and to really think about the blessings, the many and great blessings. Giving thanks is a self-perpetuating practice of gratitude. It's something that we're continually doing. It's not one day a year, one season of the year. But biblical thanksgiving means that we're doing that continually, constantly. Giving thanks increases as you think about your blessings. If you get your focus right, then the gratitude increases. Worries tend to disappear. You have worries? Well, what, what, one way of solving that is to begin to be grateful. Complaints begin to vanish. Courage to face the future increases. You're afraid of what's ahead of you. If you give thanks and practice that, 
then your courage will increase. Resolutions, goals are formed in life when I begin to focus on the good that God has done in my life rather than the bad. And then there is peace in my heart and in my mind. So that's what Thanksgiving is, showing gratitude to what someone has done for us in this context, what God has done for us. Secondly, when should you give thanks? He answers that, he says, always. You should give thanks after the blessing has been received. We find in Exodus 15, the children of Israel have crossed the Red Sea. The first thing that they do after God's blessing is to stop and to give thanks to Him. You should give thanks during times of distress. We find that Jonah is in the belly of a great fish. I believe that that is a true story. I don't think it's a mythological tale, as some would say. I think it actually happened, particularly because of Jesus quoting Jonah as it referenced his, his death and his burial uh, for three days as his Jonah was in the belly of the fish. So the Son of Man will die and be raised from the dead. But in the belly, while he turns his eyes and begins to focus on Jerusalem and worshiping there, he says this, Those who cling to worthless idols forsake faithful love, but as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. You should give thanks also before the battle that you face, the problem that you face. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I want to read the text there, Jehoshaphat is about to go into battle against the Amorites and the Moabites, and the, the Lord has already told him that you're going to win the battle. This is my battle. And he, now this is different from Joshua. This is the Lord's battle. I'm going to win it. And he said, you need to be still and watch the salvation of the Lord. Again, that's what was said to Moses, or Moses said to his people before they crossed. Before they crossed the river, he said the very same thing. Be still and watch the salvation of the Lord. And so before they go into battle, he says this in verse 21. Then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord and some to praise the splendor of his holiness. <clears throat> when they went out in front of the armed forces, they kept singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for his faithful love endures forever. The moment they began their shouts and praises, the Lord set an ambush against the Amorites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir, who came to fight against Judah, and they were defeated it's interesting that in these contexts in fact remember Paul in the Philippian jail what does he do he begins to sing praises he gives thanks to God that much of thanks is expressed by singing in the Bible when you read the Psalms those are songs many of them of praise and thanksgiving to God expressing notice always whatever the context is of the situation before, during, or after, that we're giving thanks to God. Maybe you're in the battle right now. It's hard to give thanks. But learn from Jonah. You know something's coming. Learn from Jehoshaphat to give thanks before you go into battle. Thank him for what God is going to do. Notice also, for what should you give thanks? In the same vein, he says, for everything. Always, that's when we do it. But what should we give thanks for everything? We give thanks for blessings, physical, the health that we have, the spiritual blessings that we have, which are far more important. In fact, when Jesus healed people, the focus was not on the physical healing, but on the spiritual healing. The physical healing was to get the attention of those who were suffering, also to minister to them, but also to get the crowd's attention of the authority that he had to heal, not just physically, but to heal spiritually, to forgive men of their sin. We should give thanks for the ordinary blessings that come to us. The fact that you were able to get out of bed, get dressed, and come to church today, that's an ordinary experience for many of us. But we overlook that that's a blessing from God. One day we're not going to be able to do that. But while we can do it, we should give thanks for the ordinary. Then there's the extraordinary blessings, the things that are out of the ordinary. And we often overlook that those come from God. 
we somehow there's a disconnect. We just miss it that, that God has provided this answer. Of course, we give blessings for the past blessings, the present blessings, the future blessings that are going to come. But listen, we also give thanks to God for the things that he has withheld from us that we thought were for our good. Look back over your life and stop and think about the things that did not happen that you thought God should do. And I'm sure today you're very grateful those things didn't happen. We think, well, it, it, it didn't matter. No, it mattered a lot what God withheld from you. And we give thanks for that. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians. So because of Christ, I am pleased in weaknesses and in insults and catastrophes in persecutions and in pressures. We studied that passage last week. In everything. Notice with Paul again and again, in every circumstance, particularly when he was in prison, when he was challenged, when he was persecuted, when he faced problems, that he always was giving thanks. Again, I'm reminded of this great verse, Romans 8, 28, that all things, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Now, how should you give thanks? Notice he says, very important point here, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why does he say that? Why are we giving thanks in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Because of what he has secured for us. Every blessing that we have, he secured that blessing. We have never secured one blessing. He secured all the blessings by his work on the cross and gives those blessings to us as believers. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. But they come through Christ, through the work of Christ on the cross. So if I'm not a believer, I have no way of receiving the blessings of God because it's not in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how they come. Christ also is the perfect example of how we should give thanks. Before the multitude, he multiplied the loaves and the fish. Before they ate, he gave thanks. There was an issue that was before the crowd. Jesus was not worried about it. The disciples were and they come, of course, what are we going to do? But what did he do? He gave thanks and solved the problem. Before he called Lazarus from the grave, he stopped and he gave thanks to God for the glory that was going to be revealed through the work of Christ. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he thanked God for the bread. The Bible says that he broke the bread and he said, this is given for you. My body is given for you. Sometimes somebody will say that, uh, you know, Jesus, his body was broken on the cross. Well, that's not true. The prophecy in the Old Testament is that not one bone of his body would be broken. And not one bone was broken. But his life was given. He was given for us. And that's what the bread represents. That he was our substitutionary atonement for our sin. He took our place for that. Because of his humility... He always gave thanks in all things. Were it not for Christ, it would make no sense for us to give thanks. Think of what happened this past week. We naturally, probably, before the meal, maybe after the meal, maybe a time of reflection with family, we stopped and we gave thanks. We talked about we shared with each other the blessings that God has given to us this past year. But what did the unbeliever do? Who is he giving thanks to for what he's experienced? He has no context of understanding what we know to be true. We have someone to give thanks to. He doesn't. And so none of that happens apart from Jesus Christ. Apart from him, all things do not work out for good. In fact, nothing works out for good. And the things that he thinks are good in his life aren't going to matter at the end of his life because there's no one that he was able to recognize to give thanks to for what he had been given. Now, why is this true? Because 
we do not recognize the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is Lord and that we've submitted our lives to him. The believer understands that, that he is my Lord. I've submitted my life to him. But the unbeliever doesn't recognize that. That's why it doesn't work out at the end for his good. Now notice in the same vein, really what I want to get to, the main point, is to whom should you give thanks? He says to God the Father. Now, if you've picked up on what I said, there's two kinds of people, those who are ungrateful and those who are grateful. Let's talk about those who are not grateful. The atheist does not thank God. How can he thank God? something that doesn't exist in his mind. So he has no reference of giving thanks because he doesn't believe God exists. But then you have the skeptic or agnostic who does not thank God because he may believe that a force exists, that there may be a God who exists, but he's skeptical about who he is and what he does and having any possible relationship. There's a force, there's a being out there, but there's no way of knowing that, uh, in, uh, that being in a personal way. So he's skeptical, so he's not going to give thanks. It's unnatural for him to do that. He's unsure in his own heart if God exists, so why would he give thanks? The forgetful person will not thank God. You see, thanking, thanking God requires remembering, remembering the blessing. And so often we're not giving thanks to God because we don't remember the blessings. Parents, often don't you say to your children when they were little, remember to give thanks. You're probably telling your 35-year-old child to do the same thing. Remember to give thanks. Remember to give thanks. What's the parent trying to say? You have to remember. You have to think about it. It's not natural to us because we're focused on ourselves as human sinners. So he said, remember, remember, when you forget God's blessings, then you cannot be grateful for those blessings. The one who feels self-sufficient will not be grateful to God. I've worked for what I have. I deserve what I have. This is what I have done. Well, that person doesn't recognize that the ability, the giftedness that you have to do what you do in order to receive what you've received comes from God. It's not just what you possess, but it's the ability to possess it that comes from God. The greedy person will not be grateful to God for his blessing. He's too consumed about thinking about what he wants rather than what he has (coughs) and being grateful for it. There's always more, not enough. Paul warns of this danger. He says in 1 Timothy, for the love of money is the root of all evil. That's where we usually put a period and we stop the verse. <clears throat> Notice what he says. And by craving, craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. You want to be a greedy person? It's going to end in a bad way. You'll never be satisfied. You'll never be happy. At the end, it won't work out. <clears throat> the envious person will not be grateful. He's always too busy coveting what someone else has that he wants. And so he's not grateful. Proverbs 14, 30, envy rots the bones. It eats away at it over time. It's not overnight, but over time it eats away. There are those who are not grateful to God, but there are those who are grateful to God. A grateful person has a strong belief in God. When you look at the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, They were men of great faith, and they were men who had a grateful heart. They were men of thanksgiving unto God. You find them over and over again giving thanks to God because they had great belief in God, strong faith in God. And a strong faith in God causes Christians to thank God. Grateful people feel dependent upon God. It's easy to be thankful when we remember That everything that I have comes from God. I'm dependent on Him for everything. The breath that I breathe comes from Him. The existence that I have comes from Him. Everything that I've experienced in life comes from Him. I'm dependent on Him. That means there's no room for pride or self-sufficiency since every blessing comes from God. 
Grateful people remember what God has done for them. Remember the story of the ten lepers who approached Jesus. They were all healed. Jesus sent them away. They start running down the road. One comes back, falls to the feet of Jesus, and gives thanks. What does Jesus say? Thank you for doing that. No. Where are the other nine? Isn't that interesting? Where are the other nine? Are you the one or are you one of the nine who stops and says, Lord, thank you for what you've done, what you did? They remember. Grateful people remember what God has done. To the Philippians, Paul wrote, I give thanks to my God for every what? Remembrance of you. Without remembering, there's no thanksgiving. Grateful people also have hearts filled with love. Just as pride and greed and envy produce ingratitude, love produces thanksgiving. Now here's the point. The more love you possess, the more grateful you express. The more gratitude you express. The more love you possess, the more gratitude you express to God and also to others. Grateful people take time to give thanks. You know, if you really stop and think about it, an attitude of gratitude just doesn't happen. I have to stop. If I'm going to say thank you to somebody, I have to stop what I'm doing. I have to write a note. I have to call them. I have to uh, go by and see them. It, it requires effort. It requires intentionality in order to do that. And it does so with God. If I'm going to be grateful to God, I have to stop. And it takes time. It takes energy, intentionality, focus for me to say thank you. Why is that important? Because we're often rushing into God's presence in prayer, asking Him for Him to do something for us. But no, we stop and we say thank you. They, those who thank God take time and listen, He deserves it. He deserves it. So grateful people find a blessing in every event of their life, in all things. Matthew Henry, a great pastor, wrote, wrote a commentary. He was robbed, and after that, in his diary, he said this. Let me be thankful, first, because I was never robbed before, second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life, third, because although they took my all, it was not much, and fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. I think that's a great perspective about something bad that happened in his life. Someone wrote these words. Count your blessings instead of your crosses. Count your gains instead of your losses. Count your joys instead of your woes. Count your friends instead of your foes. Count your smiles instead of your tears. Count your courage instead of your fears. Count your full years instead of your lean. Count your kind deeds instead of your mean. Count your health instead of your wealth. Count on God instead of yourself. Many years ago, a king was going to recognize a private soldier in his army. And he wanted to give him his own personal cup that was decorated with very expensive jewels on the outside of the cup. So there was a ceremony and he called forth the, the soldier. And as the soldier came up and approached the king, he said, This is too great a gift for me to receive. And the king replied, replied, this is not too great a gift for me to give. You see, God's the great giver. And the gift that he wants to give to you is not too great a gift for him to give because of who he is. You know, this Thanksgiving week uh, was a week of highs and lows for me personally. I received word that Mike Eby, who's a member of our church, was in his home and he was going down into the basement and he missed a step. He fell down the steps and died instantly. I went to his home that evening and met with Sheila and the family. Of course, it was a very tragic situation, unexpected, very sad. 
But Mike uh, was a great man of God. I met them for the very first time back in the choir room when we were getting ready to go to Israel. We were supposed to go in 2020, but COVID prevented us from going. And then in 2022, we went, as I've shared, uh, that experience there in Germany. But Mike and Sheila started uh, planning to go on the trip. And they were not members here. They had not visited our church before. But I don't know what happened, but on the trip, we just seemed to connect. Uh, delightful people. Uh, I had the privilege of baptizing them in the Jordan River. Uh, they wanted to do that symbolically. Jesus had been baptized there. And so they wanted to do that. And uh, they, they were really blessed by that experience. And he talked about it often since we came back. But after we returned, they made the decision to begin attending our church and eventually joined our church about a year ago. They became very involved, they, members of a life group class. Uh, a very, very, very life group. She, she would text me often during the week uh, saying she was praying for me, for my family. Uh, she was very interested in what was going on in certain situations. And uh, she, she told me when I was there at the home, she said, Pastor, he loved this church. He really loved coming here. He, he felt that God really spoke to him. He enjoyed the members of the church, how they embraced both of them. And Mike was a man who humbly walked before God. He wouldn't be a guy who would draw attention to himself. He would walk in a room and, and you probably would not recognize him or know him. But he was a man who had a very grateful heart. I remember on the trip, he began to talk about his life, his life experience, and how God had blessed him in so many ways through the years, uh, going to Vietnam and fighting there in the jungle, coming home, and then being able to uh, have a farm he'd always dreamed of having. God blessed him with that farm. She brought that up again uh, the other day when I visited with them. There are two kinds of people. Mike, at the end of the innings that he played in his life, Mike won. Mike understood that all of his life was blessed because he gave thanks to God the Father in the name of his Lord, Jesus Christ. How about you? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? There might be somebody here this morning who would say, Pastor, I've never given my heart to Christ as my Lord. I know about Him, but I really don't know Him as you've described today. My heart has not been grateful to God because I've not recognized that my blessings come from Him. And today you begin, begin a journey of faith with Him by trusting Him as your Lord and Savior. So in just a moment when we sing this next song, I want to invite you to come to turn from your sin, to turn from your way, and turn to Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. You may not be sure what to do or what to say, but we'll help you as you come forward. There might be others who are here today, many in this room. Maybe you've not been as grateful to God as you should have been. Look, it's convicting for me. It's convicting for all of us because it's easy for us to focus on the problems of life rather than being grateful to God for his blessings, even of the problem itself. What did David say? It was good for me to be afflicted that I might learn of your statutes. And he had a lot of affliction in his life. And so today, may we humble ourselves before the Lord and say thank you, particularly of his son, Jesus Christ. There might be others that God is leading you to become part of our church family like Mike and Sheila did a year ago. And I invite you to come today. There are others, maybe you just need a quiet moment here at the altar. Maybe you want someone to pray for you. You let us know and we'll do that. God, how blessed we are to know you, to experience you, to serve you, to see you at work in our lives and in the lives of others others so that they can know you and experience the blessings we know are true of our lives the love 
the grace, the mercy, the joy, the peace that you give to us. Lord, I pray you'll help these who need to make commitments now. In Jesus' name, amen.